Chapter 5, Part B of The Wealth of Nations, Book 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Escalera. The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith. Book 4, Chapter 5, Part B. Of Bounties. Our country gentlemen, when they imposed the high duties upon the exportation of foreign corn, which, in times of moderate plenty, amount to a prohibition, and when they established the bounty, seem to have imitated the conduct of our manufacturers. By the one institution they secured to themselves the monopoly of the home market, and by the other they endeavored to prevent that market from ever being overstocked with their commodity. By both they endeavored to raise its real value, in the same manner as our manufacturers had, by the like institutions, raised the real value of many different sorts of manufactured goods. They did not, perhaps, attend to the great and essential difference which nature has established between corn and almost every other sort of goods. When, either by the monopoly of the home market, or by a bounty upon exportation, you enable our woolen or linen manufacturers to sell their goods for somewhat a better price than they otherwise could get for them, you raise, not only the nominal, but the real price of those goods. You render them equivalent to a greater quantity of labor and subsistence. You increase not only the nominal, but the real profit, the real wealth and revenue of those manufacturers, and you enable them either to live better themselves, or to employ a greater quantity of labor in those particular manufactures. You really encourage those manufactures, and direct towards them a greater quantity of the industry of the country than what would probably go to them of its own accord. But when, by the like institutions, you raise the nominal or money price of corn, you do not raise its real value, you do not increase the real wealth, the real revenue, either of our farmers or country gentlemen. You do not encourage the growth of corn, because you do not enable them to maintain and employ more laborers in raising it. The nature of things has stamped upon corn a real value which cannot be altered by merely altering its money price. No bounty upon exportation, no monopoly of the home market, can raise that value. The freest competition cannot lower it. Through the world in general, that value is equal to the quantity of labor which it can maintain, and in every particular place it is equal to the quantity of labor which it can maintain in the way, whether liberal, moderate, or scanty, in which labor is commonly maintained in that place. Woolen or linen cloth are not the regulating commodities by which the real value of all other commodities must be finally measured and determined. Corn is. The real value of every other commodity is finally measured and determined by the proportion which its average money price bears to the average money price of corn. The real value of corn does not vary with those variations in its average money price, which sometimes occurs from one century to another. It is the real value of silver which varies with them. Bounties upon the exportation of any homemade commodity are liable, first, to that general objection which may be made to all the different expedients of the mercantile system. The objection of forcing some part of the industry of the country into a channel less advantageous than that in which it would run of its own accord. And, secondly, to the particular objection of forcing it not only into a channel that is less advantageous, but into one that is actually disadvantageous. The trade which cannot be carried on but by means of a bounty being necessarily a losing trade. The bounty upon the exportation of corn is liable to this further objection, that it can in no respect promote the raising of that particular commodity of which it was meant to encourage the production. When our country gentlemen, therefore, demanded the establishment of the bounty, though they acted in imitation of our merchants and manufacturers, they did not act with that complete comprehension of their own interest, which commonly directs the conduct of those two other orders of people. They loaded the public revenue with a very considerable expense. They imposed a very heavy tax upon the whole body of the people. But they did not, in any sensible degree, increase the real value of their own commodity and by lowering somewhat the real value of silver, they discouraged, in some degree, the general industry of the country, and instead of advancing, retarded, more or less, the improvement of their own lands, which necessarily depend upon the general industry of the country. To encourage the production of any commodity, a bounty upon production, one should imagine, would have a more direct operation than one upon exportation. It would, besides, impose only one tax upon the people, 
that which they must contribute in order to pay the bounty. Instead of raising, it would tend to lower the price of the commodity in the home market, and thereby, instead of imposing a second tax upon the people, it might, at least in part, repay them for what they had contributed to the first. Bounties upon production, however, have been very rarely granted. The prejudices established by the commercial system have taught us to believe that national wealth arises more immediately from exportation than from production. It has been more favored, accordingly, as the more immediate means of bringing money into the country. Bounties upon production, it has been said, too, have been found by experience more liable to frauds than those upon exportation. How far this is true, I know not. That bounties upon exportation have been abused to many fraudulent purposes is very well known. But it is not the interest of merchants and manufacturers, the great inventors of all these expedients, that the home market should be overstocked with their goods, an event which a bounty upon production might sometimes occasion. A bounty upon exportation, by enabling them to send abroad their surplus part and to keep up the price of what remains in the home market, effectually prevents this. Of all the expedients of the mercantile system, accordingly, it is the one of which they are the fondest. I have known the different undertakers of some particular works agree privately among themselves to give a bounty out of their own pockets upon the exportation of a certain proportion of the goods which they dealt in. This expedient succeeded so well that it more than doubled the price of their goods in the home market, notwithstanding a very considerable increase in the produce. The operation of the bounty upon corn must have been wonderfully different if it has lowered the money price of that commodity. Something like a bounty upon production, however, has been granted upon some particular occasions. The tonnage bounties given to the white herring and whale fisheries may, perhaps, be considered as somewhat of this nature. They tend directly, it may be supposed, to render the goods cheaper in the home market than they otherwise would be. In other respects, their effects, it must be acknowledged, are the same as those of bounties upon exportation. By means of them, a part of the capital of the country is employed in bringing goods to market, of which the price does not repay the cost, together with the ordinary profits of stock. But though the tonnage bounties to those fisheries do not contribute to the opulence of the nation, it may perhaps be thought that they contribute to its defense, by augmenting the number of sailors and shipping. This, it may be alleged, may sometimes be done by means of such bounties, at a much smaller expense than by keeping up a great standing navy, if I may use such an expression, in the same way as a standing army. Notwithstanding these favorable allegations, however, the following considerations dispose me to believe that in granting at least one of these bounties, the legislature has been very grossly imposed upon. First, the herring bus bounty seems too large. From the commencement of the winter fishing, 1771, to the end of the winter fishing, 1781, the tonnage bounty upon the herring bus fishery has been at 30 shillings the ton. During these eleven years, the whole number of barrels caught by the herring bus fishery of Scotland amounted to 378,347. The herrings caught and cured at sea are called sea sticks. In order to render them what are called merchantable herrings, it is necessary to repack them with an additional quantity of salt, and in this case it is reckoned that three barrels of sea sticks are usually repacked into two barrels of merchantable herrings. The number of barrels of merchantable herrings, therefore, caught during these eleven years, will amount only, according to this account, to two hundred and fifty two thousand two hundred and thirty one and a quarter. During these eleven years, the tonnage bounties paid amounted to one hundred and fifty five thousand four hundred and sixty three pounds eleven shillings, or eight shillings two and a quarter pence upon every barrel of sea sticks, and to twelve shillings three and three quarter pence upon every barrel of merchantable herrings. The salt with which these herrings are cured is sometimes scotch, and sometimes foreign salt, both which are delivered free of all excise duty to the fish curers. The excise duty upon Scotch salt is at present one shilling sixpence. That upon foreign salt is ten shillings the bushel. A barrel of herrings is supposed to require about one bushel and one-fourth of a bushel foreign salt. Two bushels are the supposed average of Scotch salt. If the herrings are entered for exportation, no part of this duty is paid up. If entered for home consumption, whether the herrings were cured with foreign or with Scotch salt, 
only one shilling the barrel is paid up. It was the old Scotch duty upon a bushel of salt, the quantity which, at a low estimation, had been supposed necessary for curing a barrel of herrings. In Scotland, foreign salt is very little used for any other purpose but the curing of fish. But from the 5th of April, 1771, to the 5th of April, 1782, the quantity of foreign salt imported amount to 936,974 bushels, at 84 pounds the bushel. The quantity of Scotch salt delivered from the works to the fish curers to no more than 168,226, at 56 pounds the bushel only. It would appear, therefore, that it is principally foreign salt that is used in the fisheries. Upon every barrel of herrings exported there is, besides, a bounty of two shillings eightpence, and more than two-thirds of the bus caught herrings are exported. Put all these things together, and you will find that, during these eleven years, every barrel of bus caught herrings, cured with Scotch salt, when exported, has cost government seventeen shillings eleven and three-quarter pence, and when entered for home consumption, fourteen shillings three and three-quarter pence and that every barrel cured with foreign salt, when exported, has cost government one pound seven shillings five and three quarter pence, and when entered for home consumption, one pound three shilling nine and three quarter pence. The price of a barrel of good merchantable herrings runs from seventeen and eighteen to four and five and twenty shillings, about a guinea an average. Secondly, the bounty to the white herring fishery is a tonnage bounty, and is proportioned to the burden of the ship, not to her diligence or success in the fishery. And it has, I am afraid, been too common for the vessels to fit out for the sole purpose of catching, not the fish, but the bounty. In the year 1759, when the bounty was at fifty shillings the ton, the whole bus fishery of Scotland brought in only four barrels of sea-sticks. In that year, each barrel of sea-sticks cost government, in bounties alone, one hundred and thirteen pound fifteen shillings. Each barrel of merchantable herrings, one hundred and fifty-nine pound seven shillings sixpence. Thirdly, the mode of fishing, for which this tonnage bounty in the white herring fishery has been given, by buses or decked vessels from twenty to eighty tons burden, seems not so well adapted to the situation of Scotland as to that of Holland, from the practice of which country it appears to have been borrowed. Holland lies at a great distance from the seas, to which herrings are known principally to resort, and can therefore carry on that fishery only in decked vessels, which can carry water and provisions sufficient for a voyage to a distant sea. But the Hebrides, or western islands, the islands of Shetland, and the northern and northwestern coasts of Scotland, the countries in whose neighborhood the herring fishery is principally carried on, are everywhere intersected by arms of the sea, which run up a considerable way into the land, and which, in the language of the country, are called sea-locks. It is to these sea-locks that the herrings principally resort during the seasons in which they visit these seas. For the visits of this, and I am assured of many other sorts of fish, are not quite regular and constant. A boat fishery, therefore, seems to be the mode of fishing best adapted to the peculiar situation of Scotland the fishers carrying the herrings on shore as fast as they are taken, to be either cured or consumed fresh. But the great encouragement which a bounty of thirty shillings the ton gives to the bus fishery is necessarily a discouragement to the boat fishery, which, having no such bounty, cannot bring its cured fish to market upon the same terms as the bus fishery. The boat fishery, accordingly, which before the establishment of the bus bounty was very considerable, and is said to have employed a number of seamen, not inferior to what the bus fishery employs at present, is now gone almost entirely to decay. Of the former extent, however, of this now ruined and abandoned fishery, I must acknowledge that I cannot pretend to speak with much precision. As no bounty was paid upon the outfit of the boat fishery, no account was taken of it by the officers of the customs or salt duties. Fourthly, in many parts of Scotland, during certain seasons of the year, herrings make no inconsiderable part of the food of the common people. A bounty which tended to lower their price in the home market might contribute a good deal to the relief of a great number of our fellow subjects, whose circumstances are by no means affluent. But the herring bus bounty contributes to no such good purpose. It has ruined the boat fishery, which is by far the best adapted for the supply of the home market, 
and the additional bounty of two shillings eight pence the barrel upon exportation carries the greater part more than two-thirds of the produce of the bus fishery abroad between thirty and forty years ago before the establishment of the bus bounty sixteen shillings the barrel i have been assured was the common price of white herrings between ten and fifteen years ago before the boat fishery was entirely ruined the price was said to have run from seventeen to twenty shillings the barrel for these last five years it has at an average been at twenty-five shillings the barrel this high price however may have been owing to the real scarcity of the herrings upon the coast of scotland i must observe too that the cask or barrel which is usually sold with the herrings and of which the price is included in all the foregoing prices has since the commencement of the american war risen to about double its former price or from about three shillings to about six shillings i must likewise observe that the accounts i have received of the prices of former times have been by no means quite uniform and consistent and an old man of great accuracy and experience has assured me that more than fifty years ago a guinea was the usual price of a barrel of good merchantable herrings and this i imagine may still be looked upon as the average price all accounts however i think agree that the price has not been lowered in the home market in consequence of the bus bounty when the undertakers of fisheries after such liberal bounties have been bestowed upon them continue to sell their commodity at the same or even at a higher price than they were accustomed to do before it might be expected that their profits should be very great and it is not improbable that those of some individuals may have been so in general however i have every reason to believe that they have been quite otherwise the usual effect of such bounties is to encourage rash undertakers to adventure in a business which they do not understand and what they lose by their own negligence and ignorance more than compensates all that they can gain by the utmost liberality of government in seventeen fifty by the same act which first gave the bounty of thirty shillings the ton for the encouragement of the white herring fishery the twenty third of george the second chapter twenty four a joint stock company was erected with a capital of five hundred thousand pounds to which the subscribers over and above all other encouragements the tonnage bounty just now mentioned the exportation bounty of two shillings eight pence the barrel the delivery of both british and foreign salt duty free were during the space of fourteen years for every hundred pounds which they subscribed and paid into the stock of the society entitled to three pounds a year to be paid by the receiver-general of the customs in equal half-yearly payments besides this great company the residence of whose governor and directors was to be in london it was declared lawful to erect different fishing-chambers in all the different outports of the kingdom provided a sum not less than ten thousand pounds was subscribed into the capital of each to be managed at its own risk and for its own profit and loss the same annuity and the same encouragements of all kinds were given to the trade of those inferior chambers as to that of the great company the subscription of the great company was soon filled up and several different fishing chambers were erected in the different outports of the kingdom in spite of all these encouragements almost all those different companies both great and small lost either the whole or the greater part of their capitals scarce a vestige now remains of any of them and the white herring fishery is now entirely or almost entirely carried on by private adventurers if any particular manufacture was necessary indeed for the defence of the society it might not always be prudent to depend upon our neighbours for the supply and if such manufacture could not otherwise be supported at home it might not be unreasonable that all the other branches of industry should be taxed in order to support it the bounties upon the exportation of british-made sailcloth and british-made gunpowder may perhaps both be vindicated upon this principle but though it can very seldom be reasonable to tax the industry of the great body of the people in order to support that of some particular class of manufacturers yet in the wantonness of great prosperity when the public enjoys a greater revenue than it knows well what to do with to give such bounties to favorite manufacturers may perhaps be as natural as to incur any other idle expense in public as well as in private expenses great wealth may perhaps frequently be admitted as an apology for great folly but there must surely be something more than ordinary absurdity in continuing such profusion in times of general difficulty and distress 
what is called a bounty is sometimes no more than a drawback and consequently is not liable to the same objections as what is properly a bounty the bounty for example upon refined sugar exported may be considered as a drawback of the duties upon the brown and muscovado sugars from which it is made the bounty upon wrought silk exported a drawback of the duties upon raw and thrown silk imported the bounty upon gunpowder exported a drawback of the duties upon brimstone and saltpetre imported in the language of the customs those allowances only are called drawbacks which are given upon goods exported in the same form in which they are imported when that form has been so altered by manufacture of any kind as to come under a new denomination they are called bounties premiums given by the public to artists and manufacturers who excel in their particular occupations are not liable to the same objections as bounties by encouraging extraordinary dexterity and ingenuity they serve to keep up the emulation of the workmen actually employed in those respective occupations and are not considerable enough to turn towards any one of them a greater share of the capital of the country than what would go to it of its own accord their tendency is not to overturn the natural balance of employments but to render the work which is done in each as perfect and complete as possible the expense of premiums besides is very trifling that of bounties very great the bounty upon corn alone has sometimes cost the public in one year more than three hundred thousand pounds bounties are sometimes called premiums as drawbacks are sometimes called bounties but we must in all cases attend to the nature of the thing without paying any regard to the word end of book four chapter five part b